everyone, and welcome back to Human Biology here at Chaminade University. Today, we, we will be discussing cellular reproduction and cancer. To discuss cellular reproduction, we should talk about the cell cycle. So eukaryotic cells are a little bit different from prokaryotic cells in that they are more complex and they have a compact chromosome. Now, for a prokaryotic cell, the chromosome is going to be in a circle, um, and it's going to be generally just one. DNA in eukaryotic cells, again, it's going to be linear, it's packaged into a compact chromosome, and there's going to be multiple chromosomes depending on the organism of interest. We as humans have 46 chromosomes, that's 23 chromosomal pairs, 22 of those chromosomal pairs are what we call autosomes or non-sex chromosomes, and two of them are the X and the Y, which we refer to as the sex chromosomes. Now, there are two ways that we can reproduce our cells. For example, if we cut ourselves and cut our skin, then our skin is just going to repair itself. So we have general growth, division, and repair. And that's going to be what we call mitosis. Mitosis is a division mechanism where um, somatic cells, so not sperm and egg, sperm and egg are considered germ cells, but all other cells of your body are able to reproduce themselves so that we can grow, we can repair, um, etc. And during this time, we're going to make one copy of our cell and then divide one. So one copy of every chromosome and then one division. In that way we'll have replaced everything in the original cell and the second cell. So we'll have a complete copy. It will be exactly genetically identical to its parents. Now meiosis, in contrast, is a specialty type of division that occurs only in germ cells, only in sex cells like sperm and egg. And this time we will have one, replica um, one replication event and two division events, which means that we will go from what we call diploid, or two copies of every chromosome, to haploid, which means we have one copy of every chromosome. So this question you're referring to somatic cells and germ cells. Germ cells are going to be sperm and egg found particularly in your gonads, um, and the somatic cells are going to be every other cell in your body. All right, so we're going to talk about mitosis first, which is the way that cells are going to undergo their regular mechanism of growth, differentiation, and repair. And it's divided into multiple phases. Um, the interphase is the time frame that's going to lead up to mitosis. During this time frame, the cell will be undergoing growth, synthesis, which is when we're going to be replicating our DNA, and more growth. And then we'll enter into the mitosis phase itself, the mitotic phase itself. After that, we'll enter into cytokinesis. Cytokinesis is when we are separating one cell into two. So we're taking what looks like, remember this is three-dimensional, what looks like a big oval, and we're turning it into more of a figure eight and tightening that belt and tightening that belt until we finally end up with two distinct cells. Okay, so mitosis is this teeny tiny little part here, and the rest of it is going to be what we call interphase. Interphase is everything between the mitotic events. And sometimes a cell might exit out of mitosis after it's finished its last mitotic event, and then just sit here, either in G0, which is like cell cycle arrest, where we're not actually going to be continuing on at all. So that's here in G0. But if a cell is going to be selected for cell division, it's going to enter into three major sections. First is G1, then synthesis, which is S, and then G2. During G1, the cell is going to grow. G stands for growth. So we're going to have a cell growth phase right before the DNA replication phase. The DNA replication phase here is depicted by S, or the synthesis phase. During this time frame, the chromosomal proteins are all duplicated. Um, everything is going to be completely copied. And then we're going to have another growth phase after this, after the DNA replicates, where the cell prepares for division and makes, makes sure that the DNA has been faithfully replicated. If all goes well, and it passes a nice little checkpoint here that says, yes, your DNA has been faithfully replicated, and you are the cell that we have chosen for division, we're going to enter into mitosis. Mitosis is split up into four major phases, then it is followed by cytokinesis. Prophase is kind of like setting the stage for the whole mitotic event. Then during prophase, we're going to have our nuclear envelope dissolve. We're going to have our chromosomes condense down into... Um, our chromatin condensed down into chromosomes, and then we're going to start getting into what we call the metaphase plate. During metaphase, everything lines up in that metaphase spread, metaphase plate. All of the chromosomes are going to line up in the middle. We're going to have spindle fibers that are coming from either side to connect at the center of the chromosomes in a region called the centromere, the kinetochore of the centromere. Um, and then we're going to get ready for anaphase. During anaphase, the chromosomes are actually going to get pulled apart, split in half. So what was an X now becomes two small I's, and they're going to be pulled to opposite poles. 
During telophase, we're going to have our nuclei recondense, and we're going to start tightening down that belt. Telophase is followed almost immediately by cytokinesis, the way that walking out the door is followed almost immediately by the door shutting behind you. Telophase and cytokinesis kind of go hand in hand. At the end of telophase, we enter into the cytokinesis event where we are splitting into two separate cells. Okay. So we spoke previously about homologous chromosomes. Homologous chromosomes are going to be chromosomal pairs where one's maternal and one's paternal, meaning one comes from your mom and one comes from your dad. And they're going to have the same genes, but they might have different variations of those genes. Remember, we might have genes for hair color, but one per allele might be red and one allele might be blonde, right? So alleles are going to be variations of particular genes that are at a specific locus. And you're going to get one of these alleles from each of your parents. Now, um, sister chromatids are different from homologous chromosomes because sister chromatids are a result of DNA replication, which means that they're going to be an exact Xerox of the one next to it. So this is like getting the exact Xerox of the book that you were reading as opposed to getting a different version of it from the library. Okay, So homologous chromosomes are going to have the same um, chapters, if you will, or the same genes, but they might not be identical. We might have different alleles, but sister chromatids are going to have the exact same alleles all the way down because, again, it's an exact copy of the DNA. Now, this is not something I'm going to test you on, but I just want to point out that the amount of chromosomes that an organism have is not necessarily directly related to the complexity of the organism themselves. Um, for example, shrimp have a double the amount of chromosomes that we do. Um, not sure exactly why. Humans, again, we have 46. Um, kangaroos have 16. Obviously, we would all argue that kangaroos and humans are more complicated than, say, shrimp. Uh, perhaps chickens. Certainly more complicated than potatoes. Um, and crabs, again, much higher. So the number of chromosomes the organism have is not directly correlated to the complexity of the organism, although in some cases it is, right? The fruit flies are going to have less. The slime mold is going to have less. But, um, but again, it doesn't always correlate. Okay, so when we're getting ready to divide during interphase, the homologous chromosomes are going to replicate during the S phase. And that's going to form two identical copies. Again, these are called sister chromatids. These are exact copies as opposed to homologous chromosomes, which are going to be a chromosomal pair. Um, because we have 23 pairs and then we're going to make sister chromatids of each, we're going to end up with, um, so 23 pairs is 46. Double that, we're going to end up with 92 just before, 92 chromatids just before the splits. Um, of mitosis. So the sister chromatids are joined together by the centromere region. The centromere region is where the spindle fibers are going to come together um, and help pull these guys apart. So what do I mean by replication? Okay, so this is the difference between homologous chromosomes where we do have the same genes we might have different alleles, so at the same lo loci, so loci. So although this might be hair color and eye color, we might here have red and blue, and here have blonde and brown. Um, but sister chromatids, on the other hand, come from DNA replication, so they are an exact copy of each other. And if this one is blonde, that one is blonde as well. And if we've got brown eyes, we've got brown eyes here too. So sister chromatids are exactly identical. Where is the centromere region that I keep talking about? That's right in the center here. We're going to have spindle fibers coming from the opposite poles from this side and that side connected there and then eventually pulling what is currently an X back into two separate I's to opposite sides. So again, we're going to have 46 chromosomes, right? That's 23 pairs. And each of them will have duplicated into two sister chromatids. So we will have 92 sister chromatids, which will then be pulled to opposite sides. And as soon as they separate out, they become their own chromosomes again. So each cell is going to receive 46 chromosomes. All right, so if we look at the chromosomes inside a human and we align them by size, we can make what's called a karyotype. So a karyotype is an organized arrangement of chromosomes where we compare them based on their size, shape, and location of their centromeres. Some centromeres are in the middle, others are more towards the end. Um, and this is the karyotype on the right here. It's showing 23 different pairs of human chromosomes. Again, the largest one being 1, the very smallest one being 22, and in this case, XX, but a Y is much, much smaller, so the X and Y also pair. So these guys are called sex chromosomes, and chromosomal pairs 1 through 22 are the first 22 autosomal pairs. Okay, so this is an overview of mitosis and meiosis. Okay, so in somatic cells, we undergo mitosis, where we produce two cells. They are genetically identical, and they end up being diploid. What does that mean? Diploid means that they have two copies. 
So right here, this is a diploid cell. We have two copies of one, two copies of two, two copies of three, two copies of four. When we were looking at sperm or egg cells, we would only have one of each of these copies. The egg would have the X and the sperm would have either an X or a Y, but we would not have two copies of chromosome one and two, et cetera. We, we would rather have one copy of each, and that would be called haploid. So a haploid cell only has one copy of each of the chromosomes, and that's going to be specific for sperm and or for eggs. Okay. Um, so mitosis is going to be preluded by interphase. Interphase is when we're setting the stage for cell division, where we're copying our chromosomes. So again, that's during the S phase. Um, and then the chromosomes are going to start condensing down during a process called condensation. Um, and by the time we hit prophase, we're going to be able to see them as what we typically think of as those nice pretty X chromosomes, X-shaped chromosomes. Um, after the Last checkpoint of G2, we enter into mitosis. Again, we have four major stages, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And during prophase, multiple things happen. This is basically setting the stage for the main event, which is metaphase. Um, prophase is when the condensed chromosomes start to become visible. The nuclear envelope disappears entirely, so does the nucleolus. And we have centrioles, which are going to be separating to opposite sides of the cell. The centrioles are going to be the location where the spindle fibers are going to be pushing outward. Um, and the spindle fibers are going to come out of the centrioles, making these microtubule networks that are going to connect to the region in the center of the centromere called the kinetochore. All right, and once we do that, everything is then going to get lined up into mitosis, or to the metaphase plate, and we're going to um, take a moment to make sure everything is in order. So the metaphase spread takes a second longer than it should just to make sure that everything is connected properly just like your attendant would do before you started, say, an amusement park ride. Because what's going to happen next is that every single one of these chromosomes is going to get split into two separate sister chromatids will separate into each of their own chromosomes to opposite sides, and it'll have to be connected by that centromere tightly to make sure that it's going to the right way. Um, so before this, we're going to make this equatorial plane, which is going to be called the metaphase um, basically a metaphase plate, and then we'll enter into anaphase where the sister chromatids separate and the kinetic cores are going to rip in two, and that means that the, the spindle fibers that are coming from one side and spindle fibers coming from the other side are literally going to rip these sister chromatids in half, pulling the chromatids towards the poles, and then eventually during telophase this whole thing is going to be dismantled because the these chromosomes have made it into the polar regions. We're going to be reforming our nuclear envelope around the set of chromosomes on each pole, and the nucleolus is going to reappear, and the chromosomes are going to start to unwind. At this point, we're setting ourselves up for cytokinesis, when we're going to actually be separated into two separate cells. Okay, so this just shows the phases of mitosis. Um, during interphase, the all of the DNA is generally going to be relaxed and uncoiled, so it's not going to be condensed into what we typically recognize as chromosomes, like this here, which is what starts happening during prophase. So again, we're going to lose our nucleus, so we're going to lose our nuclear envelope, and we're going to lose our nucleolus. The spindle fibers are going to start coming out of the, the centrioles. So centrioles first start off in the middle, and then they're going to split to opposite sides. Once we start splitting to opposite sides, here's its top and bottom is how it's depicted here, the next thing is going to be metaphase. During metaphase, we're going to have the chromosomes aligned to that nice metaphase spread during that equatorial plate. And from the spindle fibers coming out of these um, centrioles are going to be connecting to the centromeres. Centromeres in the very center. And the very center of the centromere is a kinetochore region, which is the actual clip where this spindle fiber is going to connect in. Once it's all lined up and we say everything's pretty enough to go ahead and pull apart, we're going to start anaphase, pulling the chromosomes to their opposite sides. After this point, we're going to reform our nuclear envelope and our chromosomes are going to start to kind of become relaxed and disassemble. Eventually we're going to have cytokinesis which follows imme almost immediately after. This is what I meant. We have like a figure, an oval that becomes a figure eight that eventually becomes two small O's. Um, and that's going to be when we're apt actually out of the end of mitosis and back into interphase again. So again, cytokinesis occurs at the very end of mitosis. It's going to be the final division of the cytoplasm into two halves that are approximately equal. And it happens by the contraction of actin filaments that are going to pinch the cell into two parts. So it's going to become a cleavage furrow that appears between the two daughter cells that eventually is going to split into two. So here's the contractile ring of microfilaments right here. They're going to tighten and tighten and tighten and tighten. Here's also showing it right there in an SEM photograph. And then eventually we're going to split into two separate cells when the cleavage furrow finally continues and the belt is tightened so far, the drawstring tightens all the way around until we end up with two separate cells. So that's cytokinesis. All right, so understanding how the cell cycle works is really important in terms of making sure that we can keep it in check 
because when it goes awry, we end up with aberrant gene functions and aberrant things like cancer. So the cell cycle is controlled by multiple different checkpoints to make sure that every stage is fully completed before the next stage is advanced towards. And that happens by a bunch of feedback loops. So we have feedback from the cell determining whether or not the cell switches from one stage to the next. And we have three major checkpoints. The first is found at G1. Basically, is this the cell that we want to divide? Does it have the right DNA? Do we need this at this moment? Yada, yada. And if so, it'll exit out of G1 into the S phase. During S phase, it will synthesize the DNA and proceed full steam ahead until it reaches a checkpoint at G2. During G2, this checkpoint will say, have you faithfully replicated your DNA? And are we still certain we want to proceed? If the answer is no, this cell will self-destruct. Literally, it has doubled all of the DNA and it's not gonna be able to be helpful or useful as a normal cell anymore. If the answer is yes, which hopefully it is, it will proceed on to the mitotic event. And during the mitotic event, we're gonna have a metaphase checkpoint, just making sure that everything is lined up. Like I mentioned, take a little bit longer at metaphase, make sure everything is lined up before we pull things to opposite poles during anaphase. Okay, so these are the cell cycle checkpoints that I just talked about. One, is this the right cell that we want to send for division? If it is not, it'll enter into cell cycle arrest and stay in cellular senescence, which is like basically um, the cell is not going to be dying immediately, but it is also not going to be reproducing anytime soon. Um, if, it does, if it does pass this checkpoint, then it'll go through S phase, do to do, it will reproduce all of its DNA, and then at the end of G2, it will have one more checkpoint. Was the DNA faithfully replicated? Are we sure we want to proceed? This one is fatal. If we do not pass this checkpoint, this cell will die. If we do pass this checkpoint, we will enter into mitosis, then we will have one more checkpoint, again, at that metaphase plate. Okay, so I just spoke about these three checkpoints and what they're for. Um, the G1 checkpoint decides whether or not the cell should divide. The G2 checkpoint decides whether or not the cell should enter into mitosis if everything is going according to plan. And the M checkpoint occurs during metaphase and is going to make sure that we're able to have the cell and the metaphase plate all line up properly. Okay, so cancer is a really broad term for cells that are growing out of control. Apparently normal cells start growing uncontrollably and spread to other parts of the body. When we end up with a cluster of cells, this is called a tumor. And as you can see, we could get a tumor from any kind of cell of the body. So we have a lot of different types of cancer and they all require different types of treatment and different types of um, whether they can be more aggressive, etc. But we're going to split them into two separate types of tumors. Benign tumors are going to be tumors that are not ready to spread to other areas. That means that they are encapsulated, they have a healthy layer of cells that surround them, and they're basically held in place. They are unlikely to cause great damage at this time. Now, malignancy is when a tumor is not encapsulated and is able to spread. This means this tumor is going to become invasive. So malignant tumors are going to have cells that shed off and they're going to migrate they're going to emigrate out to different areas of the body and form new tumors. These are called metastases. And once you get to the point where we have secondary metastases, well, now we have metastatic cancer, um, which is problematic because now we don't have localized cancer. We have cancer that is spreading. All right, so these are the malignant cancer cells. This is a lymph vessel, and this is a metastatic cell. It's a cell that has broken free of the cancer cluster or the tumor and has put itself into the blood vessel so that it, so it's intravated into the blood vessel and can then extravate out of the blood vessel at a later point anywhere that it chooses. The problem with this is that it most often is going to go to bone and then to the brain. And once we end up with bone cancer and brain cancer, these are considered the last stages. Um, it's a lot harder to treat patients who have these aggressive stage four type of cancers. So it's much better if we can catch it right here when we have a small encapsulated tumor that hasn't yet entered into the bloodstream. Um, okay, so again, cancer is a really broad term for any disorder, which is usually a genetic disorder that causes the incorrect checkpoints of the cell cycle, incorrect acknowledgement of the checkpoints in the cell cycle. So we can end up with damaged genes that are going to have incorrect control of the cell cycle, basically. Uh, mutations is just anything that causes damages to genes, and mutations can be multiple different types. They can be deleterious, they can be beneficial, they can be benign, um, but oftentimes they're going to result from exposure to the environment, whether it's chemicals or UV lights or viral exposure like HIV or HPV, etc. However, there are two major types of genes that are usually involved in cancer, and I like to consider this like the gas and the brakes. 
Okay, so in order for the cell cycle to proceed forward, we have to have gas that says, yes, it should go forward. We also have to have brakes that say, wait, we should stop at the checkpoints and make sure everything is okay, and that's normal, right? So oncogenes are the gas. Proto-oncogenes are genes that encode proteins that stimulate cell division, and when we have mutations in the proto-oncogenes, they can become oncogenes. So this is going to be like having a, a bus that, um, even though the brakes work, the gas is always on, so it's really difficult to stop this bus, right? We also have tumor suppressor genes, and these are the breaks. These are the genes that normally turn off cell division in healthy cells. And when these guys end up mutated, sometimes we can have uncontrolled cell division simply because there are no breaks on this bus. So even if you're not giving it very much gas, it's still not stopping. So usually it's a combination of proto-oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes um, that causes issues. But one of the major um, proteins that we know to be involved in cancerous cell division is a gene called P53. Remember, cancer happens because we have an incorrect control of our cell division. P53 is responsible for the G1 checkpoint. Its job is to say, sorry, your DNA is abnormal. You are not supposed to be selected for the mitotic event. You should enter into G0. So let me go backwards a little bit. P53 is right here at the G1 checkpoint, and it is supposed to check whether or not the DNA in this cell is accurate if it's capable is it the one that we want to reproduce and p53 is usually very very discerning and will stick cells into cell cycle arrest if it doesn't like multiple different things about their dna however when p53 is damaged it's going to allow damaged cells to divide unchecked because it's no longer going to prevent cell division of a cell that has damaged dna okay so here's a normal p53 gene that has this particular DNA repair enzyme along it. And here's the mutated P53 gene that did not have the DNA repair enzyme occur, so we're not going to end up repairing it back to normal. And so what ends up happening? Well, in this case, so this is the normal P53 gene, so what's supposed to happen, it's going to find the DNA mutation, it's gonna fix it, and then allow the cell to divide. Or it's gonna say that we're not able to fix that DNA mutation, sorry, and enter into what I was calling programmed cell death, which is known as apoptosis. Sorry, cell, you cannot proceed as programmed, right? Either something has to be fixed and then you can divide, or you cannot divide and you're going to enter into apoptosis. But if we have a problem here, this mutated cell survives instead of being fixed, and this mutated cell becomes a cancerous cell. So if P53 isn't doing its job, it's not proofreading properly and making sure that the DNA is faithfully replicated and that this is the cell that we want to enter into the cell cycle, then we can end up very quickly with cells that are cancerous with unchecked cellular growth. So if any of the following different types of genes are mutated, cancer can develop. Um, they can happen if genes that are involved in cell cycle regulation like proto-oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes again the gas and the break it can happen if dna repair enzymes aren't doing their jobs um, it can also happen with if we have an increase in genes that increase angiogenesis what does that mean that means the creation of new blood vessels and blood vessels are very important because just like you're going to need septic if you're building a town we need blood vessels if we're building a tumor so tumors are also going to often have high amounts of new blood vessels being created again angiogenic factors so genes that increase angiogenesis are going to help that tumor out drastically as well as genes that are involved in apoptosis why well apoptosis is programmed cell death so if you're supposed to be targeted for programmed cell death and you can somehow avoid it well, now you can live a nice, long, happy life as a cancer cell, uh, particularly if you're able to reproduce and divide over and over again. So you can see what I mean when I say cancer is a really broad term because a lot of different mutations that can arise in many different genes can cause cancer in many different cell lines. Now, um, there's been a lot of talk recently about your diet and how you can regulate your chances or risks of cancer by eating particular foods that have phytochemicals in them. Phytochemicals are chemicals that help regulate your immune response or perhaps decrease that blood vessel formation or they're antioxidants that help the cre um, prevent the creation of things called free radicals. Free radicals do have increased DNA damage, etc. And so there's a whole list of anti-cancerous foods including vegetables, nuts, seeds, tea, garlic, turmeric, fish, berries, etc. 
Um, okay, so over 30% of the deaths in Canada every year are due to cancer. In women, the most common is breast, in men, the most common is prostate. Overall, the top four are lung, prostate, breast, and colorectal. And the interesting thing is that over 70% of cancer deaths are preventable. Now, they're not preventable when people already have the cancer, but they're preventable early on in life by lifestyle choices. We can also, um, we also note that certain carcinogens are going to be any chemical compound that's going to increase your potential risk of cancer. These are some of the common carcinogens you may encounter in your daily life. Radiation, asbestos, acrylamide, um, dioxins, tobacco, um, benzenes, formaldehyde, HIV, HPV, charred meat, even charred meat contains something called benzopyrene, um, aluminum, UV light, etc. So there's a whole list of different types of carcinogens. Okay, so let's take a moment to shift gears a little bit, and now we're going to be talking about meiosis. So meiosis is different from mitosis because meiosis is going to produce sex cells. Um, so meiosis is going to produce gametes, like sperm or eggs. Remember, gametes are haploid. They have half the normal amount of DNA, and not just a random half, exactly half. One copy of chromosome one, one copy of chromosome two, where the, the full genetic complement would be two. And the cells that are going to undergo meiosis are cells that are in the gonads, right? Cells in the testes or in the ovaries in mammals. And the end result of meiosis is different from the end result of mitosis in that the end result of meiosis is going to be four genetically distinct haploid cells. These cells are not going to be able to turn into an organism until they are able to fertilize. A sperm is going to have to fertilize an egg, for example, to restore the full genetic complement to produce a zygote that is completely genetically unique from either one of the parents and also completely genetically unique from any of the other offspring produced by those parents. So here's an overview of meiosis. Here we have a haploid egg, a haploid sperm coming together to make this diploid zygote. Inside the diploid zygote, we're going to be bringing in, here's the maternal homolog coming from the egg. The haploid sperm is delivering the paternal homolog, again, coming from the sperm. Haploid gametes are going to have 23 chromosomes. Instead of 23 chromosomal pairs, they only have 23 chromosomes. And again, we're going to be bringing one set of 23 with another set of 23 together to be able to make 23 pairs. And that's why that DNA test is called 23andMe because we're talking about paternity. So you're talking about where the 23, you might know where one set of 23 came from, where did the other set of 23 come from. All right. So we have multiple different types of reproduction. So in smaller organisms like plants um, and bacteria produced binary fission, we undergo what's called asexual reproduction, where there's no genetic exchange of information. The offspring have the exact same DNA as the parent, so binary fission and, and genetic cloning in plants are going to re result in genetically identical offspring. Now, humans do actually also engage in asexual reproduction. Now, we're not going to create new humans from asexual reproduction. That would be like cloning. Um, but we do engage in asexual reproduction all the time. Every time that our cells are injured and need to be repaired, or as we grow, we're going to create new cells constantly. In fact, every seven years or so, every cell in our body has been replaced um, by mitosis, which is asexual reproduction. But sexual reproduction, or meiosis, is when we're introducing genetic variation into the gametes. And all eukaryotic organisms have some version of meiosis. Again, meiosis has two cell divisions and only one replication. So we have replication before meiosis one, and then we have meiosis two. So we're going to have one replication and two division, ending up with a haploid cell. Meiosis one separates the homologous chromosomal pairs first. Meiosis two separates out the sister chromatids. And at the end of meiosis, the result is that we have one diploid cell that is going to be either four, we start with one diploid cell, right? And we end up becoming either four haploid sperm or for the egg, it becomes one haploid egg. And that's interesting um, because what ends up happening there is that all of the cytoplasm from all four of the options of the egg all end up in one. And the other ones end up being what we call polar bodies or not usable results of the meiotic division. Um, other major differences between males and females are that males are going to be producing sperm all the time. Once they start producing it at sper uh, sperm at puberty, they're going to be producing sperm for the rest of their lives, over millions per day, millions per ejaculate. Um, females, on the other hand, have an odd meiotic event where they start producing eggs before birth. So during embryo, embryogenesis, they're going to produce their eggs, and then they have a, an, a, a halt to meiosis 
which is going to stay there until the woman starts what we call ovulating, which occurs once per month at puberty. And um, meiosis actually doesn't complete once the egg is until once the egg is fertilized. So women are actually only going to have a complete meiotic event as many times as a pregnancy has occurred, whether that pregnancy comes to term or not. So meiosis is actually unique in women, that, um, completely unique in women from the way that it works in men. All right, so meiosis one is going to have, okay, meiosis is going to have all the same phases, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. But we're, since we're going to go through it twice, we're going to give it one and two. So anytime that you see one after it, prophase one, anaphase one, or prophase two, right, anytime you see one or two after it, you know you're dealing with meiosis because mitosis doesn't need one or two because it only has one set of division. Okay, so during meiosis one, we're going to start entering into prophase. During prophase one, the homologous pairs line up, and that crossing over that I talked about previously is going to occur where we're going to exchange genetic information prior to the chromosomes pulling apart. Then during metaphase one, we're going to have the, all the chromosomes align at the equatorial plate. It looks a little bit different than last time because right now we have the homologous chromosomal pairs lining up, and then so the X's are lining up, and they're going to pull to opposite sides as X's during anaphase one and telophase one. But then during prophase two, we're going to line up so the X's are all lined up again. And during metaphase and anaphase, we're going to be pulling the X's into I's, where we're going to be pulling them to opposite sides of the poles. And then at this point, we're going to have telophase and cytokinesis. Why didn't we have the restoration here of um, our nuclear envelope? because we're immediately going into the next division. So there was no reason for us to restore the nuclear envelope until we get all the way to the end of telophase two. All right, so as I've mentioned several times now, every gene has multiple variations that are expressed in different ways. They're called alleles, right? So there's a lot of different variations for multiple different things like skin and hair color and pigmentation. And the reason that that is is because we have a ton of different genetic combinations that are inherited based on how our genes or your parents' genes were sorted out during the process of meiosis. And that means that every sperm or egg that you make and that your parents make and that your children and offspring make will always be different. Every sperm and every egg is different from one another. That's why two parents can have many, many, many children and they will always have completely unique different DNA combinations. All right, as I mentioned, during prophase one, homologous chromosomes are gonna line up together as a pair and then we're gonna have crossing over occurring between the non-sister chromatids, what does that mean? That means between the maternal and the paternal homologs. In this way, we're shuffling genetic information between mom and dad before we're splitting these chromosomes into their pairs. The pair is held together by a protein called cohesin, uh, <coughs> and it's going to allow for the crossing over to occur. All right, so again, here's our homologous pairs, and these are each sister chromatids. So these two are exact copies. <coughs> Excuse me. 